Imagine we have a box of marbles, and we are asked to arrange them in any way we wish. We can line them up in linear chains. We can arrange them in shapes like triangles or rectangles. Or we can pile them up on top of each other, making pyramids and cubes. And you may say their marbles have many faces. Imagine now we give nature a bunch of carbon atoms, tiny marbles if you like and ask nature to arrange these carbon atoms. Nature does things differently than you and I would do. She always tries to find the most stable structure she can make. And for carbon, the most stable structure is graphite. It is dark and soft. And it is what your pencils are made of. In graphite, the carbon atoms are arranged in perfect layers. Each layer is composed of hexagons, just like a chicken wire. In diamond, which also nature gives us, it's also made of carbon atoms, but the atoms are arranged differently. Here, the atoms are arranged in such a way that each carbon atom has four carbon atoms nearby. Graphite has only three carbon atoms in its vicinity. So the only difference between graphite and carbon and, and diamond is how they are arranged. And it's because of this arrangement that the properties are very different. One is dark and soft, and the other one is bright and very hard. But mind you, graphite is the most stable structure of carbon, not diamond. So diamonds are not forever. It is graphite forever. I've been telling my wife for 50 years that one should not waste money in buying a diamond ring. One should actually wear a ring made of graphite because graphite is forever. I'm still trying to convince her of that philosophy. You may say that diamond and graphite are the two old faces of carbon. In the last 35 years, we have seen some other new faces of carbon. And this is what happens when you go down to what we call nanometer length scale. One nanometer is hundred thousands of your human hair. In 1985, at Rice University, they discovered that if you take 60 atoms of carbon, they arrange themselves exactly like a soccer ball. And this soccer ball, they call fullerene or buckyballs. It is composed of hexagons and pentagons and the carbon atoms are arranged in this hollow, on the surface of the hollow cage. They got the Nobel Prize for this discovery. Six years later, in 1991, Sumio Ijima of Japan found out that you can take these graphite layers and you can fold them up and make a tube. And this is called carbon nanotube. And in 2004, two British physicists, Gaim and Novosilov, were able to use a simple scotch tape and peel off only one atomic layer of graphite, just one atomic layer. And they called it graphene. They also got the Nobel Prize for this discovery. These three different forms of carbon, buckyballs, nanotubes, and graphene, have revolutionized carbon science. Not only because they have fantastic properties, but they can have many applications in technology. For example, in solar cells, 
in hydrogen storage, in batteries, in uh, cosmetics, in uh, drug delivery. There are many such applications of these materials. And because of that, the scientists all over the world has been searching are there new forms of carbon that also can have spectacular properties. I will tell you about two such forms of carbon that were discovered here at VCU. One of them was in collaboration with a friend of mine, Qian Wang. Qian is a professor at Peking University in China, and we have been working together for about 20 years. And Qian spends a few weeks every year working with me at VCU. During one of her summer visits, she told me of a story. She and her husband were having dinner at a Chinese restaurant. And on the way back, on the wall, they saw a painting, a painting of tiles. But these tiles were made of pentagons. And she wondered whether one could make carbon having such structures. Graphene, which was discovered already, is made only of hexagons. Now, if you ask someone to tile your floor with pentagonal tiles, the answer will be, you can't do that. Because when you put pentagons together, then there will be empty spaces that you cannot fill and dust will collect there. And nobody wants a dirty floor. So then how was this painting made only of pentagons? If you look carefully at this painting, you find that these pentagons are not your regular pentagons. The five sides are not the same. These are irregular. But four of these pentagons, they fit exactly into a hexagon and you can tile a floor with hexagons. Egyptians knew of this centuries ago. As a matter of fact, this is called Cairo tiling. The idea was, can carbon make Cairo tiling structures? So with her student Sun Hong, we began to research such this for in a computer using quantum mechanics, following all the laws of physics, and the advanced computer programs that we had at our disposal. And long and behold, we did find a structure of carbon that looks exactly like the Cairo tiles. It is all made of pentagons. But there, is, there are two major differences. One was that these tiles are not flat. They are buckled. And this buckling is, you can think of three layers. The middle layer atoms, carbon atoms, have four coordination, and the top and bottom have three coordination. So in a way, this particular structure of pentagraphene, which we call, had something that resembles diamond, something that resembles graphite. And it is this buckling and this particular structure gives pentagraphene its many interesting properties. I will just mention one of them. Imagine you take a rubber band and you stretch it. It will stretch along the direction you are pulling, but in the other direction it will contract. That happens to most materials. But if you take pentagraphene and you stretch it, it will stretch in the other direction as well. And there are other properties of pentagraphene that will be very exciting once it is synthesized. The problem is, how do you make pentagraphene in a lab? So a couple of years ago, I was giving this um, talk on pentagraphene at University of Massachusetts in Lowell. That evening, I got an email from Professor Joel Therrien, who was in the talk, and he said that uh, he thinks there is a way in which pentagraphene can be made. And the idea was 
that you start with an organic molecule that already has some of the features of pentagraphene, namely two kinds of carbon atoms, one with fourfold coordination and one with threefold coordination. Then you remove these hydrogen atoms and let these carbon molecules without the hydrogen combine. And if they combine fast enough before they break up, maybe we can get pentagraphene. So after a couple of exchange of emails, we agreed upon which will be the correct or most appropriate carbon molecule to use. So Joel did this experiment in his lab in which he heated these molecules to a high temperature in which the hydrogen atoms went away and then the carbon atoms started to combine. We did exactly the same thing here at VCU on the computer following the laws of physics. And this is, I did with my postdoc, Hong Fang. So we removed the hydrogen atoms and see the best way these carbon molecules will combine. At the end, what we found is not what we're looking for. We're looking for pentagraphene. Instead, these carbon atoms made a, another structure. And this structure was made of carbon in hexagons and tetragons. But like pentagraphene, this new carbon structure turned out to also, also have a buccal configuration in which the central layer of atoms are fourfold coordinated and the top and bottom are threefold coordinated. But it is not pentagraphene. But this particular form of carbon had other interesting properties. Depending upon how you stack up these layers, we found out that one particular stacking gave us a carbon that is magnetic. Scientists have been looking for magnetic carbon for a long time and not have found anything. So this is the first time we found that pure carbon in a crystalline form can become a magnet, just like, for example, iron is. But carbon is much lighter than iron. So it can have properties and applications that you will not be able to do with iron, for example. Carbon is biocompatible, so this magnetic carbon can be used in magnetic devices. Carbon is extremely light, so you can use it, for example, in interstellar applications, outer space applications. We are still trying to perfect the synthetic technique in which we can isolate only the magnetic phase of carbon. So this is still a process that is still going on. Now, so far I have told you some of the new phases of carbon that have exciting opportunities both for science and for technology. But there's another phase of carbon that is beautiful, and I've saved that phase of carbon till the last. We are all made of carbon. Carbon is the building block of life. Without carbon, you and I will not exist. So the most beautiful face of carbon are the faces of the people that we love. And I want to tell you about one such face which brought me here to this day. And this face belongs to a teacher of mine who taught me mathematics in high school. He once arranged for me to attend an All India Science Congress. And scientists from all over the world were at this meeting. And I couldn't understand a word of what they were discussing. But it was clear to me that whatever they were saying must be very, very exciting and important. I dreamt that I want to be one like them. And that dream brought me to this country, a country where 
dreams can come true if you work hard and stay focused. As Robert Kennedy once said, people see dreams and ask why. I see dreams and ask why not. So I all wish you beautiful dreams. Thank you very much and namaste.